It's always a pleasure to have Elisa Jessup. She writes for the Huffington Post. She's a professor down at Miami, and she has a lot of knowledge and experience on a lot of different things. Alicia, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm great, thanks. How are you? Good. So I wanted to start off with this Tim Tebow stuff. I haven't had a lot of time to get into it, but to me, it's absolutely amazing that a guy, he hasn't played a regular season game in the NFL for years. He's trying out for baseball. He gets a tryout where numerous teams show up, and yet he is able to get a deal with Adidas, and he hasn't even played a game in baseball. How is this even possible? Well, I think it just goes to the point that Tim Tebow continues to be a major force in American media, and that was something that either attracted teams to him or shy teams away from him when he became a free agent after the Broncos cut him um, following the 2011 and 12 NFL season. So the thing that we have to remember about Tim Tebow is he has kept himself relevant and in the media by becoming a member of the SEC network. And he also has his own television show. So is Adidas signing him somewhat of a risky business move? Perhaps, since he isn't officially a professional athlete anymore, but he has done a good job of keeping himself relevant and turning himself into a mainstream profile and personality in the media. Business-wise, you know, a guy like Tim Tebow, a lot of people don't expect him to be able to make it in baseball for various reasons. He hasn't played the game in years. He's got a lot of things going against him. And honestly, if you watch the tryout from a physical tool standpoint, he doesn't really look flexible enough as you would expect a baseball player to be in certain ways. So if he doesn't make it playing baseball, and he's already announced that he's done with football, he said that in an interview a couple of days ago, what is going to happen with him you know, business-wise? Where does he go from there? Sure. So there's some reporters who believe that Tebow's baseball tryout was just a marketing ploy by Adidas to ramp up interest in the deal and that the deal was negotiated and close to being done before he even stepped out for the tryout. I, I don't know if that's the case from a business perspective because at the end of the day, there are still millions of people in this country who are waiting to hear from Tebow at any given moment, which is depicted in part by his social media following. So from a business perspective, I think the thing that Adidas needs to consider is can Tebow sell shoes even if he's a retired athlete? And in terms of retired athletes that are out on the market seeking shoe deals, I think that Tebow is one of the most attractive ones to partner with on a deal like this, in part because of his continued um, major media presence on television and also his multimedia presence through the internet, through things like Instagram, Twitter, et cetera. So it's an interesting business risk for a brand like Adidas, who arguably has really changed its strategy in the last 18 months. You know, less than two years ago, Adidas was the jersey supplier for the NBA. Um, it no longer has that deal. And so we see it trying to ramp up its college line of deals and then going this very interesting route where it's beginning to sign some pretty high profile individual athletes, for instance, James Harden, and now we see retired athlete Tebow. And then you see one of the most popular sneakers in the marketplace being an Adidas sneaker, which are the Yeezys um, aligned with Kanye West. So from a strategic perspective, I would argue that Adidas's strategy isn't really clear cut. It seems that what is going on with our friends up north in Portland is they're just throwing a lot of different options to the wind and seeing what sticks. And for them, maybe this isn't that risky of a business decision because perhaps they don't have too much invested in it because Tebow is a retired athlete. I don't know off the top of my head this. Maybe you would know better than I would, but what, what is the track record of business for Tim T? Because I know he had that sponsorship deal for a while with the jockey clothing and he had those TV commercials with the T-shirt, the T-shirts, and that was really awkward to watch on TV, honestly. So what, what is his track record as a business, as, as a marketable business entity? Yeah, yeah, I really don't know about that, which is surprising because I love Tim Tebow and I, I know a lot about Tim Tebow, but I, but I haven't researched that or followed that. But I, I do know that the guy draws attention. I think we can, 
look at that when he was working at his father's orphanage in the Philippines earlier this summer and news broke that he was going to speak at the RNC and it was a top story across major networks that don't even focus on sports on a day-to-day basis. So major news networks picked up the story that Tebow was going to speak at the RNC, which Tebow later came out and recanted and said was not true. So he is someone who, even though he hasn't played a down of football in several years, he continues to generate interest and turns heads. And he has a pretty great following in the United States by evangelical Christians And perhaps that's a segment that Adidas is trying to attract, that it might not be attracting fully with some of its other um, endorsees. We're talking with Alicia Jessup here on the Sports Bachelor 97.3 ESPN. Excuse me. She's a sports law professor down at the University of Miami. She also is a writer for the Huffington Post. I want to transition over to the NFL, and I want to get as much into like the sociopolitics of this Colin Kaepernick stuff, but it fascinates me the comparison between the NFL and the NBA because the NBA actually has a rule that players have to stand during the national anthem. And the NBA, I think a lot of people would argue, is a more progressive sports organization as compared to the NFL. The NFL is much more old school and traditionalist, a little bit like baseball is, but the NFL doesn't have such a role. And I, But the NFL is the largest grossing moneymaker in America sports wise. So, you know, what do you think explains, is it just because football is popular that the NFL is able to make money or is it just that the NFL is such a tradition that people love? Yeah. So I I don't know if it's necessarily fair that we say that the NFL is not progressive because in my work as a sport business writer, I've been invited behind the scenes by the NFL to watch some of its initiatives unfold. And for instance, one thing I got to enjoy this year was to be invited to the first ever NFL's Women um, Business Leadership Summit, where the NFL is putting its money where its mouth is and working to fully develop women within its own teams to rise up the corporate ladder. And to me, this was something that I hadn't seen done as well as I saw the NFL do it by other leagues. So I I think we need to be careful when we say that the NFL is not progressive, it's super traditional, because I I don't know that that's true. And so when it comes to the NFL allowing athletes to make the choice of whether to sit or stand, I think that's just another example of that. Because if the NFL was a state-operated entity or a government-operated entity, those people's First First Amendment rights would be at play. And I think that the NFL and its leaders recognize that the game is played under a very wide public scope, the NFL is the most watched sport in the United States, that they might have to give their athletes extended rights and extended freedoms that don't typically exist in the corporate world. And so I think perhaps that's what we see at play um, which you, when you discuss that NFL players have the option to sit or stand during a national anthem, where as players in other leagues don't have that same option. If I could play devil's advocate for a moment, to me the NFL has a lot of double standards because this is a league that will suspend guys for numerous games for use of marijuana, but then they don't suspend them for numerous games for things like Domestic violence. This is a, a league that allowed Dante Stallworth, who was drinking and driving, killed somebody, to have a pretty good career afterwards. But they pretty much have basically kicked out Josh Gordon for an entire year. So, and they allowed Greg Hardy to play, and but they don't let Ray Rice play. So I feel like the NFL is just constantly conflicting itself. Yeah. And what about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, that, that I mean, here, here's the thing. The, the thing is that. Those instances have all been taken up in a court of law. We have seen Roger Goodell taken to the court system more than any other commissioner in professional sports in the last decade, arguably um, longer than the last decade. I've I've only been a lawyer, though, for uh, going on seven years. So that's when I've been paying attention to what commissioners in pro sports are doing. But he's been challenged in the legal system for the suspensions that he has waged against various players for an inconsistent implementation 
of the collective bargaining agreement and the NFL's rules and bylaws. And we saw the most recent challenge upheld in the deflate gate case. And so the real issue at play, in my opinion, is this. The NFL collective bargaining agreement does not do a good enough job of perfect, or excuse me, protecting the NFL player. It is a collective bargaining agreement that was negotiated by the NFL on one side and the Players Association on the other side. And you raise a good point that what we've seen since 2011 is a very inconsistent doling out of penalties by Commissioner Goodell. But guess what? If we turn to that collective bargaining agreement, he has the power to do that because the NFLPA um, and how they negotiated the appeals process for many of these penalties, it gave Goodell the judge, jury, and executioner power. So that, that's one part of the problem is arguably Commissioner Goodell has way too much power when we look at the power that he has in comparison to other commissioners in the American professional sports landscape. On the flip side, there's this. The NFL might not have the clearest cut, most well-defined policies in place. And we saw that issue come to light with the Ray Rice situation where we did at the time have an NFL policy that stipulated that if you test positive for marijuana, you will be suspended for four games. But we did not have a policy in writing related to what happens to an NFL player if he is alleged or convicted of allegations of domestic violence. And so, hence, we see Ray Rice get hit with the two-game suspension, which later turns into an indefinite ban. So there's two things at play. When the CBA is renegotiated, and we're still a long ways out from that day, we're talking about 2021. When the CBA is renegotiated, the Players Association needs to do a stronger job of attempting to limit Goodell's power as it comes to player discipline. On the other hand, the NFL needs to do a better job of putting clear-cut policies into place so there aren't these allegations, which at this time have gone so far as to reach the United States court system, so that there aren't these allegations of unfair um, penalizing by Commissioner Goodell. I want to transition now over to the Philadelphia 76ers. This is a team that, you know, for all intents and purposes, has been in some ways the laughing stock of the NBA for the last few years. It's been a very frustrating transition, but they finally got the first overall pick. They got Ben Simmons, and this is insane, the financial benefits that have happened. According to Fanatics.com, Ben Simmons is the 10th best-selling among all NBA players' jerseys since he got drafted. And we had uh, Scott O'Neill, the Sixers CEO, on with us recently. And he said that the 76ers are number one in the NBA in new full-season ticket sales. It, it is amazing to me, Alicia, the financial impact that one player can have. And he's not named LeBron James. He's not named Dwayne Wade. This is a in some ways, an unknown entity having such a massive impact on an organization? Well, I, I think we have to be careful in how we categorize what the CEO said. A lot of NBA teams, for instance, the Warriors, don't have season ticket packages left to sell. So when it comes to selling the most season ticket packages, to me that means there were a lot of packages left on the table, so they had the most to sell. To me, the number that's more impressive deals with this young man's jersey sales. And it shows the popularity and that the need that the NBA has for a new young talent to come out and emerge and prove himself. If you track the top rated NBA jersey sales really since 2013, you look at the top 10. Um, the leaders in that top 10 included Kobe Bryant and Derrick Rose. And there were periods of time that those two guys were leading the list and not playing games for extended periods of time. So there's been a decent amount of time that the NBA has needed someone new to captivate fans' interest. And I can't think of a better market for someone like Simmons to come into because what we know about Philadelphia is Philadelphia has very passionate sports fans. It's a huge TV market um, and it's a very populated market. And so if he can prove himself and if he can be the player that the 76ers need him to be, he is going to have an extremely lucrative career on and off of the court. 
it's funny you mentioned Philadelphia being a passionate fan base in the big TV market because you look at the guys on the list of highest selling jerseys ahead of him. Some of these guys are not in major markets, and you know some of them are retired. Kobe Bryant and Tim mm-hmm. Duncan are still top 10 selling guys and they're retired. Russell Westbrook is right. in Oklahoma City. That's definitely not a top 10 market. Whereas Philadelphia, I feel, is is that in some ways almost an untapped market? Oh, it totally is. And it's been unfortunate that the 76ers have been so bad these last few years because Philly has wonderful sports fans. And, you know, the, the question for me, though, is whether or not Ben Simmons was the right guy. So I, I had a chance to cover NBA Summer League this summer, and I went to the games with an NBA trainer who trains a lot of all-star players. And we watched Ben play. And he said, Alicia, he, he's not going to be the best player of this NBA draft. And when we come five years down the road, Ben Simmons is not going to be the best player of the 2016 NBA draft. So it's going to be interesting to see how things shake out. But, you know, I hope that the young man has a good career. I hope he proves people wrong. I just don't know if he has the leadership ability that the 76ers need. Because if you're that great of a talent and you couldn't take LSU in a pretty weak SEC where it needed to go, I'm not sure how we can expect you to turn around the 76ers. All very interesting points. Alicia Jessup joining us here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. Before I let you go, I want to kind of leave it on a little of a happy note. College football is here. And the Miami Hurricanes yes. start playing this weekend. How excited are you? I'm very excited. It's very hot here in Miami, though. The Hurricanes, luckily, on the other side of Florida, so I don't think that will bother us. But... Um, For those of you that don't know, the Hurricanes used to play in the Orange Bowl. The Orange Bowl got destroyed when the Marlins built their new stadium. So now we play in the Dolphin Stadium, um, which underwent close to $400 million of renovations to prepare for their hosting of an upcoming Super Bowl. So we basically have a new stadium, which is awesome. So hopefully our team is good this year. We don't have the most exciting first two games of the season. Uh, Things really get going later in September, but it's always nice to watch college football. Yeah, I look at Miami's schedule, and I don't don't know if they'll be like a major contender, but I think they're in a position because they do play Florida State and they do play Florida that they could uh, could mess up those two team seasons. I I would love nothing more than to mess up Florida State (laughs) season. So that's, I mean, the, the rivalries here are pretty intense, so... You, you pick one of the three schools. You pick Miami, Florida, Florida State, and then you hate the other two. So that would be wonderful. <laughs> Alicia, I always appreciate you coming on. She's a sports law professor at the University of Miami. She also is a sports business writer for the Huffington Post. Always appreciate your insights, and good luck to the U. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having me on.